Hello. Welcome, everyone. Nice to see you. I know, you know we're getting towards the end of the semester, and it's really busy, so it's great to see so many of you stepping away from your work to join us. Uh, my name is Paige Johnston, and I want to start tonight by acknowledging that the Harvard Graduate School of Design is located on the traditional and ancestral lands of the Massachusetts, the original inhabitants of what we now call Boston and Cambridge. We pay respect to the people of the Massachusetts tribe, past, present, and future, and honor the land itself, which remains sacred to the Massachusetts people. The school also recognizes the work of the Harvard University Native American program in cultivating the relationships that led to the creation of this acknowledgement. A quick reminder that we have live captioning for our online audience. Uh, you can activate that by clicking the live captioning button at the bottom of the streaming window. And then I also want to invite you to join us for another program coming up this week. On Thursday, November 9th, architect, theorist, and co-founder of the practice Dogma, Pierre Vittorio Orelli, will present research on the longhouse, the linear, long, and narrow habitation typology that existed and still exists in many parts of the world, including Southeast Asia, Europe, and of course here in North America. For more information about this and other programs we have coming up, please go to the GSD's website. Now I'll hand it over to Grace La, Chair of the Architecture Department, to introduce tonight's speaker. Thank you so much, Paige. So this year's Serpentine Pavilion, one of the most highly anticipated annual architectural commissions for a temporary structure in London's Kensington Gardens, and it, which just actually closed last week, was conceived as a dining room. Entitled A Table, the French invitation to a meal, the pavilion invites respite amidst the ever accelerating pace of modern life welcoming visitors to a communal table under a pleated origami-like roof. Uh, I, I'm usually very terrible with Instagram, but when I saw that incredibly thin, elegant roof in person this summer, the structure piqued my curiosity. Uh, so you know that I had to post it. Um, the emphasis on the materiality, form, and social consequence um, of a table differentiates this year's pavilion and provides a glimpse into the work of its designer, Lena Godme, our speaker tonight. Lena will join us to teach an option studio this coming spring as the Kenzo Tange chair, so we are grateful to the generosity of the Tange family for this opportunity to introduce her to you this evening. Raised in Beirut, Lena's approach to architecture is informed by her early interest in archaeology and her lived experience of the Lebanese Civil War, surrounded by the scars of its historical instability. One of her biographers describes her as an archaeologist of the future. That is to say, she looks to the past to excavate a site's historicity and connects these narratives to the present and future. The specificity of Lena's work extends beyond attention to physical parameters of site, informed by a research-driven methodology that, like archaeology, unearths a site's social and political foundations and the cultural circumstances that characterize it. This approach is a deeply humanist one, linking fragments of memory and nuanced particularities of a place with a formal sensibility that emerges from vernacular construction. This process produces a tangible, thoughtful layering of multiple narratives in her work. Upon graduating from the American University of Beirut, Lena moved to Paris to work with Jean Nouvel and Norman Foster, but soon thereafter won the international competition for the National Estonian Museum in collaboration with Dan Durrell and Tsuyoshi Tain. To realize the project, she co-founded her first practice in 2006 with her partners at age 26. The proposal called Memory Field repurposed a former Soviet military airfield, extending the pre-existing runway into a building that arises from the ground, linking the site's terrain with its history, uplifting it symbolically from the nation's precarious past. The project transformed a vestige of contested ground into an opportunity to redefine a cultural identity. 
Lena has since established her own eponymous practice in 2016 based in Paris and continues her commitment to unearthing site narratives, particularly by emphasizing the power of local craft and mark making. She describes Stone Garden, a residential tower and art foundation in her hometown of Beirut as an inhabited sculpture featuring a textured corrugated facade, all 13 stories of which were hand hewn using a custom 10 foot long shaping tool. The effects feel simultaneously ancient and contemporary, earthy and refined, integrated into its context while imbuing it with a hopeful freshness. Only months after the tower was completed in 2020, an explosion of the port of Beirut, less than a kilometer from the site, violently tested the robustness of the tower. Although its windows were blown out, the building structure survived largely unscathed, emerging from the wreckage of the city like a geological escarpment. Beyond her unique engagement in materiality, one might argue that she is equally interested in the realm of the intangible. The new leather goods workshop that she designed for Hermes in Normandy, which opened earlier this year, is a cadence of handmade brick arches that rhythmically evoke galloping horses and allude to the saddle making that originated in the renowned leather works. The project establishes a dialogue between the structure, the artisans, and their craft. The arches double as an approach to natural daylighting. A combination of vernacular knowledge with contemporary sustainability methods has earned the project its official recognition, the first in France to receive E4C2 designation as a low carbon and energy positive industrial building. Lena discussed this process with our very own Toshiko Mori in the recent Domus as the design that collaborates with nature. Perhaps most interesting in Lena's approach is that her archaeology of the future produces architecture that reflects the zeitgeist, places of gathering and dwelling in which we yearn to recognize our shared humanity. We are continually reminded of the critical need for mutual understanding that transcends our differences. Lena demonstrates the possibility of architecture as a medium for dialogue, realizing a tangible way in which buildings mediate conflict and deepen connections. Her approach, informed by her heritage, acknowledges and honors the complex history of a site and its people, while opening new possibilities for the future. Her Serpentine Pavilion asks us to consider our relationships to the earth and to each other over a shared meal, one of the most beloved human rituals. This philosophy is as timely as ever. Please join me in welcoming Lena to the GSD. Thank you so much, Grace, for such a fantastic introduction. And thank you, Sarah, for having me. And everyone, I'm really thrilled to be among you at uh, GSD and presenting my process of work, uh, the process of my atelier, and how we come up with the uh, projects. So I'm going to share with you uh, the uh, thinking behind the projects that Grace talked about and others and thinking about how we can actually live in symbiosis today and uh, what does it mean actually in archaeology of the future. So every time uh, we start a project as architects, we're always looking at Earth. And uh, it's something very specific actually to, to our profession because we look at space, we look at the place. And we, uh, it makes us think that we are connected, that uh, we're one, uh, that uh, we live on this one Earth. And as we know today, humanity has uh, really become a dominant force uh, in the shaping of uh, this Earth, uh, unfortunately also in the transformation and the destruction. And we uh, long, if we continue in this manner, we're uh, actually needing more than two Earths to sustain our activity. And this is something that we can see in many cities, uh, sometimes in a more uh, striking way than others. Uh, looking at Beirut, for example, through this photo, uh, we can see how the city is built with these con concrete structures that are encroaching on the uh, Mediterranean Sea. We can see also in Beirut, uh, where I grew up, this uh, situations of inhabitation, of uh, reusing materials, but also questions of waste. 
And we, we, it really poses the question, what is resource, what is waste, and what does our way and system of uh, production produce uh, in our environment? Waste is always present. Uh, it is everywhere. It's more visually present in uh, such a context. It reminds us that there we can see where it goes, but in other places probably we don't see the whole cycle, it's invisible. But uh, in this condition actually we're always questioned and, um, and something very particular is the advent actually of the Anthropocene also marks this end of this binary vision that we may have between us and uh, Earth and us and the environment. And in this case, we always question what is a nation, what is a boundary when we are all uh, living within the same, uh, uh, with a, sharing the same challenges. And when we listen to scientists, they tell us that we're actually more microbes than we are humans because our cells are 57% composed of microorganisms and only 43% could be human. So we are nature at the end. And at the end, when we look at Anchimboldo's paintings, we, they tell us that we are just vegetables. So that makes us question what, how much nature and architecture and uh, sometimes sites in Beirut of uh, nature growing out of walls or even uh, growing out of archaeologies uh, had always inspired me because I'm always thinking about how, you know, every time an archaeology emerges, we see again nature and uh, just architecture becomes the ground, it becomes, it weathers with, uh, with the ground again. And nature has a particular way to exist in such a context. It's organic, it just seeps through uh, these organic constructions that are informal, that has been uh, done incrementally. And every time uh, a new construction happens, there is this archaeology that emerges with different traces. And we think about an our ancestors, what has been there. And it's a similar process uh, to architecture. Uh, in a way, uh, we tend to think uh, in my atelier that uh, the architecture is about emergence, like this obelisk that has been found in Egypt that was not completed and that is still being sculpted from its environment before it's lifted up vertically. So the process of building is one that looks at the past, looks at how we develop our, uh, in, how in, we inhabit actually our environment, and maybe thinking about construction as a way of emerging, of re looking at the ground, at the environment, and at every construction as a continuity and as a transformation of what had been there. So the process of making in, is never linear. It's not like a singular inspiration. It tries to uh, take this take this complexity, actually, that is behind an act of construction and tries to make out of it uh, a space that is anchored in its environment. Uh, and that is about dialogue and about experimentation, about testing, whether by hand through model making or by drawing through really relating to the paper and relating our mind and our bodies to uh, this act of tracing. And by making, by testing with materials, going sometimes in the micro scale, whether it's a chair or a small detail of, a, uh, of uh, an element that is attached to a bar, uh, and, and looking at various scales of design, uh, not only uh, about like the scale of uh, the exterior, but really looking at the intimacy of design and the materiality. So we can see here work about with materials like uh, glass here that find its way in uh, boutiques like a chocolate uh, boutique in France, in uh, Paris, or the work on uh, Sanukia, which are these uh, left out uh, like potteries that, has, that, are, that are being wait, waiting to be baked actually. Uh, exhibitions and trying to to really work with the ephemerality of uh, light of materiality uh, and looking at all, all these ingredients as one in the making of architecture so architecture is somehow between archaeology between the future between nature and humanity and humaneness 
And when we're linking to archaeology, we're linking to the past, what had been there, to research, to place making. Uh, and uh, we're linking to humanity, to the humaneness of, uh, of any construction in the way that it could be inclusive, that it could talk about diversity, about nature because it's nurturing, it's uh, related to an ecology, of, uh, to the environment itself, uh, to beauty as an essential uh, as essentially present in architecture and the future because every act of renovation, of making, is an act of newness at the same time. And within this, there is a certain modes of resilience or resistance. And maybe through different projects, and there, there is a sense of what I grew up with in Beirut as well. So maybe when I'm talking about the Estonian National Museum, uh, it's about resisting occupation. Because this project uh, that is an ethnographic museum in Estonia was a competition that was open um, like to participate in, in 2006. It's set in uh, Tartu, so Estonia is very uh, south of Finland. And Tartu is the cultural capital of Estonia. And the country has uh, regained its uh, independence from the Soviet occupation in 91, and it uh, joined the European Union in uh, 2003. So they had struggles with different times of occupation, for, with a lot of Estonians that had been sent uh, to Siberia at that time. Uh, and the building of that uh, museum was for, for them a way of uh, reaffirming their identity and their nation, their belonging, rootedness to this earth in which they uh, feel belonging and they have thrived. And Tartu is a place uh, where a lot of folk dance is happening, where they have been uh, also performing, where there is a cultural uh, identity that has been developing. And the museum is housing this collection that is maybe important for Estonians themselves because it's about uh, accumulating this uh, uh, narrative that is linked to a Finno Ugric culture, to one that is related to the Finnish culture, uh, and that also talks about their history, about repetition, about really uh, trying to belong through the accumulation of objects. And one of the very particularity of the site of this uh, museum when we were doing this competition uh, was this scar that is just cutting the landscape. And actually, the brief didn't talk about it. They set up uh, the, uh, the, the site to be here and really ignored that uh, whole uh, scar that is just cutting the landscape. And when we started researching, we discovered that actually this was one of the largest military airfields in the Soviet uh, times and in the Baltic states. And that was dismantled and was just sitting there. And looking at the history, that was really the place where the Estonian claimed their identity, where they claimed their independence from the Soviet occupation, uh, and uh, where they rioted from the city center into this uh, land itself. So in a way, the museum uh, wasn't just about setting an object that just sits uh, in its site. We decided to take the museum out of that site that was assigned in the competition and to link it to that airfield and to give it more of an urban regenerator uh, responsibility or also a way to connect to that platform and transform, in a way, what has been there into uh, into the realm of the museum. But by doing so, also the museum as a national museum could be open as a building. It's not anymore about an icon that really uh, crystallizes identity, but it was, uh, for me, about defending identity as uh, something that is constantly moving and where the architecture is allowing for that movement through the fact that it has two entrances through the fact that it relates to this infinite realm, which is this uh, airfield in which it, uh, it lands. Uh, and in the way it transforms within this landscape from in the entrance towards also disappearing within the landscape itself.
So the building, like uh, when we submitted the competition uh, presentation, we made these sketches about like these collages with this airfield that is becoming a place where people could come all together and somehow invade again this uh, construction. And uh, funnily, that was the moment where I realized the responsibility of us as architects, because actually, when we started constructing, all the people of Estonia and mainly of Tartu, Tartu came over and ra like rallied all together to really uh, announce the construction of this building. And the scale of the uh, functions inside are more designed to the human, or let's say to follow the scale of the inhabitation of the city. So again, moving with the, between the micro scale of this 40,000 square meters building, but again, bringing this human scale into its uh, own uh, inside. And as we move, it's a place of different activities where there is a, like auditorium space, exhibition spaces, and as we move uh, forward, we go into this airfield. And one of the challenges was also to convince them to have two entrances, and at the same time, by having two entrances, there is also a multiple narrative to the collection itself. And the whole gown of the building, this glass, is fitted with this uh, typical uh, motif that is this cornflower that was used by uh, many women uh, during occupation time as a sign of resistance uh, to the occupation and uh, as a language, actually, that became uh, drawn on uh, all these textile work. So in a way, symbolically, the whole building is uh, also dressing with the same uh, pattern, in a way. And then as we enter, uh, we enter into a space that is uh, these open spaces that are between the different functions. They become spaces where different performances can happen, where they appropriate these spaces, uh, while the functions are more said to be like a boutique or other ones. And one of these spaces is this bridge that is linking the uh, entry point to the exhibitions. And uh, while the client didn't want these uh, spaces because they considered the, them to be empty, uh, when we, we actually defended to have these spaces, and they ended up being the spaces where all the performances would happen, where they actually perform their own culture. All the, the spaces inside are done with local wood and local materials. And as we exit actually the building, then we go into this uh, empty or like this open ground that becomes a place for artists and for different interventions to happen. And here we can see one movie actually that was done by uh, cinematographers, like um, Estonian ones, and we can see how they inhabited uh, themselves the space of the museum. So they they really like portrayed also uh, some scenes in areas that uh, were not uh, designed to be inhabited, and I find it really interesting how sometimes uh, artists and the people inhabit spaces that we as architects we don't design as such, and that's really the magical part uh, for me uh, when it occurs. So the, the lady was really uh, being filmed in the cantilever on the entrance of the building. And this is happening on the bridge of the uh, building. And when it comes to uh, like delivering the project, I was asking some, uh, some of the users, like, what do you feel about this museum? And uh, one of them was saying the museum here acts as a bridge between two shores, and one side is the past and the other is the future. And it is helping us to turn our heads from the past into the busy and innovative future full of meaning and drama. Moving from uh, occupation and maybe talking about amnesia, we can talk about Lebanon and Beirut and uh, this housing uh, that is in the port, Stone Garden. 
And this is a building that is very close to the port area, and uh, the port area that is uh, uh, like being really transformed, has been transformed uh, the past decades, just before the ex explosion, as Beirut is. It's constantly in transformation and uh, development. And it's a city that talks about you know developers uh, encroaching the city, encroaching the history of the city, uh, where we can see all these small tiled uh, houses being uh, taken away actually by these uh, towers and we can see the memory of the city constantly rewritten like a palimpsest uh, like this uh, drawing by uh, Zarina Hashimi where Beirut is constantly ra raised and drawn again and some of the photos of Fouad al Kouri, photographer, we can see here like uh, also moments of these houses where nature is part of the, of the architecture and inhabiting, inhabiting the spaces. Beirut also has a crazy energy. I mean, because it's a city that is constantly at risk, it's also a place of uh, strong life and uh, always in, uh, in festivity. Uh, and we can see moments like how the history of the city is portrayed with these uh, small, like uh, tiled roof houses uh, that had disappeared over time. And what is very particular about the site of this project uh, is uh, it's actually in, uh, like in place of this building, and that was one of the first uh, concrete factories in uh, Lebanon, and it was occupied by uh, like famous modernist architect Pierre Khouri, who had his office, and uh, he uh, let it away. The I mean, he died, and he. Uh, gave away the land to his uh, son and uh, daughter. And one of the sons is Fouad Rui, who is a photographer. But particularly the site being on the port area is very uh, close also to the city center of Beirut. And uh, if you know, the city center of Beirut has been completely ravaged after the war, was uh, like destroyed, and particularly it was refurbished very quickly and gentrified also. Uh, and in a way, it lost its uh, its traces. And for me, as um, as as I grew up in Beirut, I grew up with these uh, with the sound of uh, you know of uh, war, but uh, also with these images of war torn buildings uh, that had disappeared quickly and almost like not taking the time to scar and uh, to reflect on what what happens after the war and why do we do wars. Uh, so these photos have been taken actually by Fouad al Khouri, and uh, they are one of the um, sh like little uh, remainings of what had happened after the war. And uh, in '92, uh, he was commissioned by the city center uh, renovation company, uh, along with uh, Robert Frank and um, Gabriel Basilico and uh, other photographers, to take photos of uh, Beirut and to record the history of uh, all the destruction of the city center. And they record these moments of uh, dematerialization, but moments of where, where architecture becomes rubble again, and where the memory of the city transforms, and we transform uh, like uh, it, the, the environment, as we see this man who is completely like looking uh, hollowed, as is the building. And these moments uh, stayed in Beirut for a while. This is a photo with a visit of uh, some of my students in Paris, where we visited a building uh, that was on the green line between Beirut Est and uh, West. And uh, these moments came back, actually, when I had to design this uh, residential building, thinking how can, can we design, actually, a residential building in Beirut, very close to the city center, in this port area that is under transformation, and what can it give back to the city? And how can we create an opening, and uh, what the opening could mean? 
So all these openings in the uh, skin of that building became more devices that are framing the city, that are uh, maybe reminding us of these moments of snipers that were just sitting behind the window and uh, uh, like uh, snipering people around, but also became moments that critically bring the city back into the inhabitation and uh, give us another way to look at Beirut around us. These openings that are of double height are also ones that suddenly came uh, to reflect on these images. Of course, the process was not linear. Uh, this is uh, something that I noticed after the building was delivered through taking the photos, actually, of the building. So under construction, the structure is all in concrete with these uh, openings that are on double height or a singular height. But as it emerges in concrete uh, because of a seismic, because Beirut is a seismic area, it's, uh, it's rated seven, so it has to really be uh, resistant to any uh, seism, earthquake that could happen. Uh, I wanted also that this building that emerges like uh, a piece of earth that also talks about the uh, hands of the many workers that are coming to Beirut to work. They were fleeing the war at that time in uh, Syria. Uh, and uh, I was thinking, we were thinking, how can we make this uh, facade uh, really express the hand? And maybe talk about a plastering technique that exists in uh, Beirut, but reinvented in a different way. So the idea was to almost feel like this kind of a chiseling of the ground. and. Uh, uh, I drew this uh, comb that was uh, made on the height of the floor, and then the whole building was combed. And the process became an emotional one, starting with uh, my atelier, where we were testing with these clay-like uh, pieces, uh, with a fork, uh, working on the surface, uh, and then producing these combs, and then combing the elevation, and then working with the uh, artisans in place. Uh, and trying to, you know, chisel the, the whole uh, surface. And the process starting top uh, bottom, really from the top of the building, uh, reaching the, the lower part. And another side of this uh, work it was also to bring nature, as it exists in such Mediterranean climates. Uh, there's a common practice of uh, like uh, buildings having their pots and planters uh, on the balconies, so people really do that. And the idea was how to make it as a practice in the architecture itself and how these windows can also talk about the different scales of uh, nature. So some of the double height windows would have like large trees to be planted there, and other which, which were smaller, smaller would really uh, inhabit like planting pots. And in this way, the building would be anchored in the ground, would be really related back to the ground where nature is existing and seeping through all the cracks uh, within, uh, within the ground and within the ruins in the city. And we can see also that uh, one important aspect is how the building could really fit within its context and it cannot be Instagrammed or taken in photo in one singular moment, but it's really uh, taking the three-dimensionality of the city itself. And these windows and openings are also critiquing this uh, mushrooming of the set, uh, like apartments that are always uh, repeating uh, and being repeated by developers in cities, where we have the same plan that dictates the same way of living and that uh, actually repeats and mirrors. And maybe with these openings, it was a way also of allowing individuality on each of the floors and allowing each of the tenants to transform really these uh, living spaces. And sometimes when you have these uh, large gardens on the roof, they create like very particular situations and have different filters from the inside towards the outside of the city with nature, with the balcony but also with sometimes also the, the frame of the window becoming a painting of a photography of the city itself. 
So as we enter this building, there's like a womb-like entrance. Uh, and then on the ground floor, on a double height uh, floor, uh, there is a gallery that is dedicated to art and debate on the like matters of the Middle East. And we could see here photographies and uh, events could happen uh, actually with uh, different uh, artists. Uh, and actually, it talks about how uh, also Beirut and such contexts become really fertile for creativity. But also artists in this context play an important role. And this is what we wanted to portray through this model that was exhibited uh, recently in the Smithsonian. Uh, and uh, it was about really talking about the scenography within the model itself, with these multiple uh, photographies that were that we curated uh, of artists that depict Beirut, uh, that talk about the beauty maybe of Beirut, of the Mediterranean Sea, that brings beauty despite all the chaos, uh, of photographies of these uh, houses that are left out. Uh, and uh, talk about also the art and architecture as a way of uh, resilience, as a way of critiquing, of, uh, uh, of uh, looking at the past at, as also a way of healing sometimes. So we could see also these micro movies that uh, show uh, some excerpts of uh, movies that were filmed in the 80s uh, in uh, Lebanon about uh, people traumatized by the war. And they are actually still completely contemporary and still like living this kind of uh, cycle. We could see also small movies talking about the work of the hand, the work uh, of construction. What does it mean to construct actually within our environment? And after the explosion, and this is an excerpt that we see uh, a drone movie after the explosion of 2020, uh, so the building uh, facade withstood that uh, explosion. Uh, it was made by hand. It was really like, like stayed, even nature didn't move. But of course, all the windows were blown away, and uh, we were lucky to have some photos uh, just two months before. And then it took two years, and recently they just finished renovation. So I really crossed my fingers there won't be any explosion or any <laughs> other event that may happen. Uh, and we can see here like uh, moments also of how it uh, changes within uh, the, um, the way it's inhabiting in, uh, inhabited in the city. Uh, and this is the south facade, and this is actually bound to be covered because the uh, exploitation factor here allows that this building could go higher. Uh, when the building emerged, we were lucky that actually this building reno was renovated. They felt like they had to renovate themselves, so it was really nice. So it allowed actually that brothel to stay and just to renovate the building and to keep this uh, the like. The, the urban fabric around. And these uh, moments here where we can see this uh, cut uh, in the building, the, the whole shape is actually coming from the urban regulation. It's really about materializing in the built space this invisible uh, law that uh, shapes our construction today and that actually dictates how we should construct and uh, use this to really make it visible and uh, to, to sculpt the whole uh, structure. And here we see moments of uh, Beirut and the Mediterranean cities. You just sit outside and uh, enjoy the, uh, your home outside. And this is a photo that was taken by uh, Lauriane Genitou after the uh, explosion. And it's really uh, crazy because it feels like in the 80s almost with, uh, with these uh, military, this car, and just uh, the building uh, coming from the future. And just moving, staying in Lebanon, but completely different uh, landscape, uh, because in Beirut we are really in the city, close to the sea, and uh, many of you have heard that in Lebanon you can uh, swim and uh, go ski in the same uh, hour or the same day. So this is where you can go a bit more uh, in a cool environment. And this is in the mountain, and this is uh, like a kind of an archive museum for a collector who have been collecting 
reflecting about the history of uh, uh, Beirut and Lebanon uh, as depicted by artists. And it's a work on a new typology of a museum or archival museum. And what's interesting, it's really close to the, to the uh, shore, but it also talks about this transformation between the city uh, grounds and moving up into the nature and how this like uh, cut between uh, the scenery can happen actually on a small, very small geography. And as we sit in this landscape, here we really uh, looked at all the collection and we tried to look at how can this building really talk about the history of a uh, museum and maybe think about uh, this construction uh, as almost like an open curiosity place, like a um, cabinet of curiosity. And if you look at museums, most of the collection is always underground, it's, uh, it's invisible. And the only thing, that, and the, the one that needs to be uh, lit is really a small percentage of the museum. And we looked at all the uh, like transformation and history of uh, how, what could be the ancestor of the museum actually, maybe the pyramids, uh, or looking at uh, the temple, looking at cabinets of curiosity, and what could be very particular about this museum. And we thought maybe this museum could talk about the house, the Liwan house, which is a very particular typology uh, in uh, Lebanon, because it's about this house that has a central hall and where the rooms are all adjoined to the central hall. The central hall has a very uh, specific um, like function because it, uh, it, uh, about, it's about ventilation also of all of these rooms, but also it's a place of encounter. And we thought that this, is, this should be actually the whole of this whole uh, construction. Uh, and we started looking at how this building could uh, inhabit the site by really avoiding all the trees around, by keeping them, and by having the minimal impact on its environment. So, and thinking about how to cross between a library typology, a theater, or a museum and how maybe the building can be more occurring underground and keeping the whole uh, like quality of the site itself. And the only thing that could emerge would be this uh, Liwan, the central part. So we can see here how it's uh, emerging as uh, one whole. And as you enter into it, uh, there is all these rooms that becomes rooms that talk about art. And it's about also like the, um, uh, the visitor uh, interacting with the art rather than just being a viewer and the consumer of the arts. The landscape becomes also an extension of the uh, artworks within the building. So one enters this hall like a library, uh, but also like a theater. And as we move, we can discover the artwork and we open these uh, drawers and create one scenography. Uh, as one is moving within the space. And it is acting like a sleeping uh, animal within this uh, environment, so it's really a passive building within it. Now with the economic uh, like um, disaster in Lebanon, the building is uh, on hold. So maybe uh, at one time we will wake it up. Uh, talking about ecocide, the environment, and uh, the thinking about how to build a sustainable construction. And this was a, like a great exercise with a client who really wanted to push the boundary of what we can do in terms of a low carbon, energy positive building. And it's really interesting here because uh, it's about learning that architecture is, uh, to, to be able to do an architecture that is low carbon, that is energy positive, we have to really go technically deep into uh, its uh, functioning and understand all the mechanics actually of a construction. And moreover, that it's a manufacturer that is sitting in a very industrial site. It's surrounded by these thin buildings that are surrounding this construction. Uh, and on a very beautiful site, actually. And you always wonder, why do we build these very ugly industries with just metal tins on such amazing uh, sites that talk about color, that talk about, you know, like materials, uh, leaves, and... Um, 
And so the challenge was how to bring beauty back to the site and maybe allow uh, this building to talk about the hand, about the power of the precision of the hand, because it was about also manufacturing for leather making. Uh, talk about this micro scale, this act of tracing, of leaving a trace, leaving a positive trace on an environment. Uh, so we decided to start the construction by the material and by this uh, scale of the hand. And looking first at the resources that we can find in place. So we looked at uh, what could we construct with in uh, Normandy. So we're here in Louvier, very close to, uh, you know, in the north of uh, France. And we identified three uh, brick makers, uh, artisanal brick makers, very close to the site. So we thought, okay, we will build this project with bricks because it's the local resource is very close. And we discovered that the city center has been actually built with bricks. So. But one one thing that was uh, happening was also that the brick uh, makers were not any more skilled at constructing buildings. They were just using bricks for renovation. So we thought that was the occasion actually to transform uh, brick making and bring it, ba bring it back into construction. And this is a process of research, again, this kind of archaeology moving from the brick, like again, endeavoring into understanding the users, but also of understanding the technique of construction. And I will get a bit more into the technicity here of the building. And what did we have to deal with to design this project? So first we had to think about the energy. How do we bring the energy to this building? So it had to be renewable energies. And how do we construct in a very low carbon uh, construction manner in a way to bring well-being into uh, this building? And when we're talking about energy, we're actually talking about a very precise way of uh, moving along from a very typical construction that uh, is uh, fossil fuel based into a construction that is more virtuous, that is passive as a construction, but is also not only passive, but energy po positive in a way that it can uh, distribute its own energy. And the first step was to design a bioclimatic structure. And a bioclimatic structure is one that is able to listen to its environment and also to its function. So the first thing was to think about this, um, how, to, how to put this uh, function within uh, a, in a reasonable way uh, and uh, to talk about compactness, about modularity, because it's, uh, it's a place of making. And it, it looked to us that the, the grid was really a very powerful one to uh, inhabit the function of this building and to allow this construction to be compact. And we can see here that the whole uh, manufacture is orchestrated around these ateliers, which are uh, these three units that are repeating. And actually, they give this uh, perfect uh, square-like uh, uh, shape that uh, that is both like uh, in, like inhabiting the void and uh, the like the enclosed functions. And all, all of these uh, programs are orchestrated around the central uh, space that is what they call the Place du Village, which is like the, the place of meeting point of the different artisans. And from there, from this compactness, is about also taking advantage of very rudimental uh, elements that we always used to listen to, like light, ventilation, and nature. Uh, light, how to position the uh, like functions uh, in the north, like for example, the ateliers are positioned to the north of the buildings. Of the building, they take advantage of northern light. Uh, we can see here like a simulation of uh, how do we, how many sheds we bring to bring uh, correct like uh, uh, natural light within the building. Uh, and in this way, with these sheds, we reduced actually the need of electricity and the need of uh, cooling within the building as well. And then we uh, looked at ventilation, how to allow for natural ventilation within the building, so decreasing the need in climatization, and how to make use of nature around the building, because nature, when it's summertime with the leaves, it protects the facade, it decreases the heat gain, and in winter time, it allows the sun to seep into the facade, heating the building. 
So it's actually acting also as a, as a tool for the uh, bioclimatic approach to the building. And on the southern facade with these courtyards, we're allowing more shade and more shadow to happen, especially when uh, in heated summers and overheated summers, it becomes more like pleasant to be inside these spaces. And by this exercise with, this, uh, with our engineers, we noticed that we really get close to this uh, level of comfort that is essential to human beings. And that decreases actually our need of energy intake. And then what we give as an energy became more easy to do. And it's given by solar power or by geothermal uh, energy. And then was all the study of how to give a low carbon construction by building with uh, materials that are naturally sourced, uh, whether it's uh, earth and uh, using bricks uh, construction. And as we worked on the site, we started digging and using the earth of the site and the surrounding. We actually discovered archaeology. Yeah, so the client was telling me, that's your fault. It's archaeology of the future. We will never build this building. <laughs> but we waited a little bit, and it was the COVID. So they had uh, their time to uh, to work calmly, and then we did the building. So, But what was funny, actually, is that we discovered a Magdalenian uh, site that uh, dated 16,000 years. And they were manufacturing tools like uh, needles, like you know, with their smart hands uh, and uh, very modestly sitting there and moving from one side to the other. And this site was uh, like uh, after, like taken by, um, by snow and uh, at the glacier times. So this was also very exciting for us because it felt like this building is anchored in history and sometimes we, uh, we have to listen to that history that happens in places. So we manufactured this, uh, these bricks from uh, the earth of the site. We made 500,000 uh, bricks. So Monsieur Lagrive uh, really liked us in the beginning, but then uh, after 500,000 bricks, he was uh, happy to build this project with us. So that was um, like the brick maker and his team. They were 20. They made these uh, bricks and uh, cooked them in an old oven, oven like a Hoffman uh, oven, which is elliptical. Uh, and uh, he has been there for like 200 or 300 years, a generation of brick makers. And then we dried the bricks and we cooked them. And also, it's, uh, it was about the temperature to reach the color. And when we came to site, we discovered that actually there were no masons to build this building with a structure of brick. And they didn't know how to do it anymore. So we had to take one like master mason that had to uh, teach uh, fellow masons to w learn how to build with the brick again. And how also to take care of this material that won't be cladded, that will be just the facade of the building. And one thing that was striking for me was that they actually printed the facade of the building in one-to-one -one scale and used it as a patron to, to build the whole elevation. So it was really moving from almost the model to the uh, like scale of uh, the one-to-one -one scale. And they were proud to make this, uh, you know, to, to master this technique. And, and this is where I felt like it's really important, this belonging to what we do, actually. And uh, the act of building to become an act of love, of really, of really um, anchoring one to, uh, in, in, to the environment, in a way. And one particular thing was also that the uh, natural span of a brick uh, construction is the arch. And here we can see how thin actually the, the wall is. And that was thanks to all the calculation that we did to really calculate the uh, stress of the uh, brick spans. But also we studied the different uh, forms of the arch to really talk about also this uh, lightness of the arch that is barely sitting on the ground, that talks about also salary making, the gallops of the horse, and that is moving along uh, the site here. And we can see here like the materials inside that are all made of food. So w while all the structure is in uh, bricks, the uh, roof is all in wood and some of the partitions as well. 
So the building is a tool. It's a tool for the living, and it's also some building that grows in time. So once we enter, we enter into an outside where nature is part of the uh, outside. It's almost like a ruin, but it's uh, it's a new built. Uh, and it's a place where also people niche there. They they live within these outside spaces in close contact with nature. And then we enter into this uh, open plaza where people meet together. Uh, and then we move to the atelier of uh, manufacture. And the arch is really looking like the horse uh, back form that we see here. The saddlery are also prolonging these uh, curve lines that are of the building. Uh, and is, within the atelier, we have this kind of succession of uh, openings that really interconnect the different uh, spaces. And here we can see the sheds where the lighting uh, is diffused and allows this kind of precise work to happen. So the building was really inhabited very quickly with all these uh, objects and materials. And also when we were excavating, we used the earth of the site to create all the landscaping. So all these like different uh, levels uh, were done with our landscape uh, architect, Eric Dont, that really used these. And uh, we planted, uh, you know, aromatic uh, planting here and vegetables at uh, other parts. Uh, recuperated the water uh, from the site and from the rainwater, but also created these benches out of the formwork of the bricks. So these became back into the site. So it's really like almost like a kind of a circular economy where everything is uh, becomes part of the site. And also we had these um, honey making with uh, uh, bees. I'll just finish, I think I'm almost over my time, but I'll finish with uh, the Serpentine. And just before that, I will talk quickly about this project uh, in Paris, because it's related to the theme of the Serpentine. Uh, and uh, this is a project that is about uh, like maybe uh, resisting waste, but uh, also thinking about how can we build more sustainably, how can we build projects that talk about the waste that is happening uh, in food around uh, in our societies. Uh, and it's a building that was a, like a um, winner of a call for innovative projects by the city of Paris. And it sits in the 13th district. And it's uh, actually the city had given these sites without really giving any function. So that we had like a carte blanche to design a program from scratch. And we decided to do a program around sustainable feeding where we can research, we can innovate, we can share, and we can talk about uh, food and uh, about the culture of food and the importance of sustainable food. Uh, and uh, think about the construction of this building and its adjoined existing uh, structure, uh, almost in a circular manner, where we have an urban agriculture on the top, we have a living space, and and it all functions as one, actually. And we can almost uh, experiment in uh, uh, in tomato growing, in aquaponics, uh, vertical uh, agriculture. We can live in this place. Uh, and we can have a place also with exchange with the neighborhoods, with in the same construction. Uh, and it's all wood because it's low in uh, carbon footprint. It's about also interconnecting between the different levels and allowing an architecture that uh, that is not about just stacking of the different floors, but really connecting the different floors between each other and connecting people, actually, between the floors. And within this resilience of uh, against segregation, the project of the Serpentine at Table is about really uh, this moment of conviviality, about intimacy, about bringing a place where people could gather, where we could rethink about our relationship to Earth. And maybe when we think about our relationship to Earth, the first thing that comes to mind is food. We're rooted in what we eat. And if we eat in a more sustainable manner, we're actually transforming already our relationship to Earth. But also food is about uh, reminding us that we are climatic beings, that we are related to, uh, to this sense, actually, that suddenly when we eat, we feel home. At least for a lot of Lebanese, this is you know, what you're always like, uh, grounded to. 
Uh, and from there, we started looking at uh, how, you know, how food was depicted in history and looking at forms like in symposiums uh, where the creek uh, would uh, meet around and they uh, would um, around grand tables and they would sit on the table, lay down, have a big feast and make important decisions uh, within these uh, symposiums. Uh, but also we started looking at places of assembly, like for example, being in uh, London, maybe the Stonehenge is a moment of assembly, even if uh, we are not sure what was the function of this uh, building. But it's a moment also where we really related to the sky, we were able to uh, you know, manifest. And uh, looking also at these places of assemblies, uh, the Toguna structure in Mali uh, that was built by the Dogon people, uh, are these uh, structures that are uh, like uh, very particular because of their very heavy roofs, like very uh, wide, uh, high roofs, and where the elderly of the villages used to and still actually meet there uh, to decide on important matters. And they would uh, be invited to stay seated until they reach their uh, agreement, because if they stand up, they will bump their heads. And I wish we can have like a massive room <laughs> and where we can uh, all agree and that uh, we can stay seated and be nonviolent. And here we can see also how this is uh, also inspired by nature, by the uh, like leaf structures, by looking at uh, uh, also learning from nature, this is a pavilion that is in a park uh, that is constructed by this very simple, uh, here we can see like two columns that are holding the beam here and also that the roof uh, to brace it, it's made with these uh, beams and then with these uh, secondary structures uh, that talk also about the leaf structure uh, of uh, coming from a tree. And it, it's all braced together. And it's really about this interiority, about this closeness to maybe the table that we sit around. So people are just seated. They are linked to one another. It's also a place of event where these uh, perforated panels are bringing also light and transforming this uh, interior environment of, uh, of the space. So the, the pavilion was just dismantled, actually, a few uh, days ago and we'll find another life uh, soon, hopefully. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, and I'm going to, I know that a lot of you have questions as well, so maybe I will just kick off with one, but then open to the floor very, very directly. So I'm super curious to know, when you won the Estonian Museum competition at such an early age and had to put that project together, tell us a little bit more about what that was like for you and um, how to manage that, because that was really quite an extraordinary project uh, right out of the gate. Um, I broke my phone when we won in the project. <laughs> Actually, uh, this project, uh, yeah, we, I was working at Jean Nouvel's office and uh, on a collaboration that uh, Jean Nouvel had with Foster and Partners in London. And uh, it was a long collaboration. You can imagine two very different uh, architects working together. So, and at some point, during the end of the year, vacation time, I found this um, open competition on a site called Death by Architecture. And we're still we dying <laughs> architecture. Yeah. And, uh, and then it was really amazing, actually, a museum, uh, ethnographic museum, open uh, you know, for everyone to participate in. And I think it was very particular, because it was the moment where Estonia had joined the Euro European Union in 2003. 
uh, and it was for them a way to uh, affirm their belonging to to that European Union by opening competition to all architects participate in. And we just started with my two other colleagues doing this uh, project. I met them at that time, invited them, and we did this competition. And in January 2006, I received this call um, from uh, the state uh, ministry that we won this project. And uh, so I was so happy that I jumped in front of Pompidou and <laughs> broke my phone, and I couldn't get <laughs> reach of everyone then. And we waited for this letter to come to understand that we had to go and uh, get the prize. And then we arrived there, and then they discovered that we were like so young. You're like, you are the ones who won the project. <laughs> like. <laughs> How can we give you 40,000 square meters to build? <laughs> and the uh, first thing we did is a business card. We didn't have an <laughs> office. <laughs> so we arrived and we just give them, gave them a business card that, yes, we, we have a practice. <laughs> and, we <laughs> and then I realized, actually, that the next time I come, I should bring someone with a gray hair. So we uh, brought one of our consultants who was an economist, and uh, he came. He just came, you know, sat there, and I was fighting to f sign the contract. I grew up in Lebanon, and it, you know, it's uh, it's a place of risk. You have nothing is given to you, and uh, no government. No, you have to learn to survive and to just do things and dream actually and make them happen. So, uh, so we actually spent like two years going there trying to sign a contract. It was for me very important that the contract is a good one, that we are able to build this project and we had uh, help from consultants also that we were working with before they supported us to, uh, to negotiate that. It was tough because we didn't have resources, we had to go there. And I think also it's about people because it's about building this uh, understanding why we're doing this museum. And they thought that they were we were Estonians before because it was an anonymous competition, because the building felt so belonging to the history of the place, and it actually opened a lot of debate. So about uh, how do we treat history? And for them, some of the Estonians thought that this uh, like uh, military airfield had to disappear. Uh, that uh, we were about monumentalizing the Russians. Uh, and uh, so it opened really a debate in the press. And then I ended up moving from you know, becoming almost like a speaker's person, like trying to explain why it's important to anchor this uh, project with the history, to acknowledge that history, to maybe transform it, but also use it as part of the continuity to learn from it. And uh, and that was really the most interesting part of the process of the building, is really the, the whole narrative and the whole communication uh, with, the, uh, with the Estonians around how do we, tr what is the meaning of uh, building? Uh, I think that that's Sorry, one, of the, long story. No, it's it's one of the project, most interesting so aspects, partly because <laughs> one, one can imagine that that particular design response could have, could have been understood in a, the opposite way um, so I yes, think it does exactly. take it take yeah, a lot yeah. of yeah. of your um, yeah. ability to to interpret that project yes. and and uh, explicate it in a way that uh, would would make would really turn that idea into something that could be um, you know the, that the the community could actually be quite proud of what you could obviously see in the in those images. I'm curious also about the question of the materiality that you have been using in some of the projects. It seems like at one level, you're looking to find, you're looking to be a sort of opportunistic in a positive way. Um, you see a material being used on a site or you know that the site has access to a kind of material like the Stone Gardens type of project um, where you have access to that kind of labor. But then it seems really risky in the Hermes project to not have had the, the expertise of the bricklayers but then to invest in the idea that the entire building would be of brick. So could you tell us a little bit about that moment? Because I think that that would be, um, you know, it seems like on the one hand, incredibly decisive to decide, well, to, to, to select a material um, that you know comes from the region, but then, of course, then to realize that the labor is not there to produce it. Yeah, so yeah. 
um, of course, again, uh, like part of our profession is risk taking. Is uh, always like how do you how do you measure the risk? And uh, you have, I mean, it it was the same story in Stone Garden because we in the beginning like uh, the the developer didn't want to do this facade this way, so it was about like convincing and going through the leap to do it. Uh, and in Hermes uh, part, it was a competition in the beginning. So during competition stage, we were directly looking at what are the resources in place. And the brick came as an evident uh, choice. And before proposing bricks, we called the, the uh, brick makers, like the artisanal uh, manufacturer that are around. Uh, and we asked them if they're able to manufacture for a whole construction. And we realized that in the worst case, we will make them three of them work to manufacture the quantity for the construction. So that was sorted. We couldn't uh, sort uh, the uh, also the making, uh, but uh, I knew that there are companions. I don't know if it's the same way to say it in English, actually. It's uh, these master masons. Mm -hmm. uh, and in France, it's a profession where you have very selected people that are still, uh, they excel at their craft, whether it's uh, wood making or uh, stone making or stone masonry or uh, just masons, brick masons in that case. So the, the thought was that maybe actually we could make it. If there's one who knows, maybe we can manage to do it. And of course, then uh, the challenge was how to articulate that in the process of the project, because the project had to be delivered in three years, uh, and we didn't have a long time to uh, to uh, finish the project. So uh, when we were designing, before we went to tender we, for the whole building, we tendered, for example, the brick making before the construction of the whole, uh, all the other scopes of the, of the project. So we started with the brick manufacturer, so it started to um, to be prepared, and then we managed the tendering of all the other scopes uh, within uh, the building. So it was like separate uh, con contractors uh, that after we had to manage ourselves with uh, on site. That's that. um, and we we actually defend like mostly in France also. Sometimes you have developers who don't want the architect to be the uh, leader on site or the construction manager, and we always like uh, push to be actually leading the site construction site. So I always uh, am also managing the construction site, which allows actually more leverage exactly for this. Uh, like parts like uh, uh, finding the right people to build uh, in the skill, the skill. Because if you're not managing the site, then the manager will come and tell you actually it's not possible, because he doesn't have the maybe she or he doesn't have the right. uh, patience to uh, to fetch well, for. It, it, and that's so interesting because I think that cl close proximity to the overall production of the project is. It's very evident how you are so tied to that, but it's so unusual because, of course, like in the United States, it would be so difficult to tender that piece of the project in advance of other pieces. Like you'd you'd have to do it all at once, and um, so it's. Uh, but yes. partly by by yes. in a way, you've almost protracted the um, the way in which the project is both yes. bid and built, which is. You know, super. Yeah, and, and I think more and more we have to do that because it's not anymore about a linear process because you have to sometimes allow some findings on the construction site and on the con in the construction uh, to feed into the design process as well because right. you're getting more closer to the material. I mean, and the material will tell you something else and there are elements that you want to uh, uh, be able to master from the beginning. So there, this this. Uh, iteration becomes important and this is something for example on another project that we want to build with earth that uh, I was just discussing this morning with a client is like what's the plan B if we don't have earth and uh, mm. uh, what <laughs> so directly being scared so we have to always you know bring the context and uh, to change the processes of making right right so uh, let me open it up then to to all of you 
here. Do we have any questions? And I know that there's a microphone floating. Ah. Thank you very much for that lovely talk. Um, my question is about sort of financials. Like what happens when you come across something that might be too expensive or what if a client starts complaining about how unconventional your buildings are? What do you do? They're very conventional and simple. <laughs> they, and uh, also they're not expensive. Because uh, like if you look at the building of Hermes, it's, um, uh, it's actually 2,300 euros per square meters. I mean, I, I'm, I'm filmed. Yes. Uh, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> How they don't see me? We'll cut that piece out. Yes, please <laughs> edit out that piece. <laughs> No, it's actually like, I mean, it's about really the choices. And for example, if you look at the project in Beirut, it's about technique that uh, exists there that you can actually develop and making use of it. Um, in Estonia, they didn't have a lot of uh, resources. Uh, we, the budgets were constrained while the uh, Quai Branly was being built in uh, France, uh, over 100 million there. They, they were really like struggling to have uh, budgets from the European Union who refused to give them money because it was their museum and because the museum was not in Tallinn they thought it's not in the capital so we cannot give you money so actually the at that point uh, about financial struggles the client came to us and uh, told us so either we don't uh, have the roof accessible or we take out the envelope of the building so you have to choose and then I thought, yeah, maybe we cut the hand or the legs <laughs> and then we chose actually the envelope to keep the gown, but uh, the, the whole roof is not accessible of the building because it's in continuity with this airfield. So it's always about really being able also to consciously make choices, uh, to, uh, to think about the economy of the construction and more and more actually if you're building resilient structures that are low in carbon, low in uh, energy consumption, and that have to uh, use the least resources possible. Thank you. Oh. Our Dean. Oh. No, I, uh, merci. It was a, uh, a Terrific lecture, and the work is, um, as we were talking before, it, it's quite beautiful. Um, and so we, I, I was happy that you kept beauty on the on the front stage. Um, I, I, had a, I think a simple question, which is the the buildings, the horizontal buildings, tend to be singular buildings that sort of speak to the whole and and have complexity on the inside, and the two vertical buildings tend to be are are both Compose of pieces that that are no longer it's no longer a singularity and I wondered if you could speak to that in terms of of Why that happens in the vertical whether it's simply a, a kind of zoning envelope response um, But I would think it's probably more than that. So if, if you can speak to this the sort of singularity and complexity of, of those yeah, that's, uh, thank you, Sarah. Thank you for this question. It's actually, I was thinking about that this morning, funnily enough. <laughs> I was thinking about like why, like sometimes we, the, the horizontal and this relationship to the landscape and the, the horizontal is about this uh, anchorage to the ground, but also creating another ground about, uh, uh, about this, uh, looking at architecture as a piece of the land as well, as another layer of the land. And that, is being inhabited by another scale, so the scale of the human that brings in the complexity within. And in the vertical, when we're looking at Stone Garden, it's also marking the land, but in a different way. It's trying, it's going up, but it's always trying to mark its belonging through the fact that it brings all the lines that uh, of the like uh, building regulation into the verticality. And the building regulation is about actually looking at the ground and how do we 
how the ground affects the vertical. Because when you look at uh, the, like these uh, invisible lines, it's about drawing from the street. You have a vertical line, and then you have to go 45 degrees uh, to bring the sun back into uh, into the street, or you have to set back from uh, the neighbor in a certain way. And so it's it's about really bringing again uh, this belonging to the ground, even if you're vertical. So, and this is the tension that is created. And again, it becomes even stronger because of the use of the material or this uh, feeling of earthly feeling that again resists that verticality and again uh, talks about the under layer. Uh, the, t the nature is again another manifesto in that. It's about thinking about how this vertical can become again an archaeology and talks about uh, a face uh, from the ground, but it's moving up. So, and maybe that's why also it becomes more intense, and why the, the vertical becomes, brings in an intensity in a way. Thank you. I, I, have, um, I have a couple of questions. So I'll just start with one. It's lovely work. It seems to me you're very interested in construction labor materiality, but through how the building is built by uh, it, the, the labors you spoke about sort of calming the building. And in the case of the Hermé uh, building, with everything you did to sort of recuperate the manufacturing of brick and the brick masons, I'm curious about this may be unfair, but about the effects of that recuperation in the region, because it seems to me that such a large effort uh, may have reactivated actually the production and use of brick, which it seems like it was lost before. I mean, and it's uh, the brick making is present, but it's mostly used for uh, uh, renovation. They've been producing for renovation mainly and for small scale uh, construction. So with this, actually, it gave them another uh, mean of like of employing brick, but also actualizing brick making as a, also a tool for contemporary architecture, uh, and also like having to to know how to do masonry, uh, and the, the building is at the same time through its architecture attempting to do that, attempting to talk about an industrial construction that can have a dignity of a beauty uh, that that you don't have to look like a metal building. Uh, uh, you know, like uh, with the sheds and uh, have a stigma uh, that you're about uh, process, uh, but you can look like um, cloister, you can look like any building that can transform through time. Uh, and also through the content, because uh, actually the users uh, and the artisans within, uh, working within, are also coming from the region. So the, the, the objective was to form them and to uh, have this building as a, as a mean to, to develop employment. So there is this kind of uh, both in terms of the users of the, of the structure and in terms of its architecture to actually regenerate the territory in employment and in uh, knowledge and in material. Thank you. I never understood architecture to be a form of rebellion, justice, and speaking the truth. Um, a lot of your subjects are subjects of turmoil, whether it's resisting occupation, uh, resisting war, resisting environmental encroachment. These are extremely heavy. You building something in your homeland about a sniper, a window, how, how, what is your creative process when the subject matter is so heavy? H how do you create and express when the world is weighing on your shoulders? Um, I, I don't know. It's... Um 
I think it's about uh, also architecture as an expression of complexity and uh, accepting that architecture is about this uh, bringing all these dynamics and all this complexity of what uh, our world is and trying to to bring this together to become more intelligible and to bring it to become a form of beauty in a way. So through that, that through the, the all the lived experience that could be related to Beirut, to could be related to the war that is personal but is very collective as well. We're talking about Beirut, but we can talk about many geographies. It's about thinking about these uh, moments, as moments that can teach us to bring back serenity and to uh, actually transform uh, these moments into moments of uh, of uh, even a stronger uh, strive for togetherness and for bringing us through spaces. I believe that spaces can allow this peacefulness. They can allow these moments of intimacy, of 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 re uh, cocooning again and re becoming human and uh, and bringing the living together. The Serpentine Pavilion was a nice experiment in that because it wasn't about building a spectacular architecture. It was for me about this moment of intimacy that uh, brings people to dwell in the space, not to only take a photo of the pavilion, but really be inside and spend some time uh, sitting on the table, looking around, and suddenly you start uh, this, hearing the, the, the nature, hearing birds, looking at the person sitting in front of you. And funnily enough, people were spending hours there, writing, drawing, and then they came every day. And there is a sense of uh, timelessness. And I think that is about listening to our inner self, in a way, you know. And creativity is about that, this moment of stillness that we we need to be together. Thank you. We have one last question up there. Thank you for your talk. Um, I appreciate that you present all your projects in a state of progress or kind of still happening, like the windows being replaced. Um, the pavilion may be finding a second life, the archive project may be happening or restarting. Um, and I'm curious how you, whether you see your projects in that way and how you frame your own position in that. Is there a moment where you kind of have to stop and kind of take yourself out of it or step away from a project or do you see yourself always involved with them? Um, they, they remain. Uh, they remain part of. Uh, maybe they are involved with me rather than me both of them, because they remain as uh, learning processes actually. And uh, as we move from one project to the other, we're always learning from what we've done there, and then how the building becomes a learning process, bo both in the making and both for us actually as architects. So they're not just singular objects and. Uh, that that uh, that don't relate to each other they have relations and mainly not stylistic relations they have uh, thought processes actually uh, that allow us to uh, to learn and to 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 grow in what we do um, but I think also what's important that the, is that the, the buildings and the spaces are uh, inhabited they are appropriated by the people they become for the people we actually and that's the best that we they really feel like this is theirs and the architect almost disappears afterwards and, and becomes just like uh, the story is what remains actually that is more read by uh, and lived rather than just a conceptual story that I can say but actually people uh, do inhabit it and continue to make it. Wonderful answer. Thank you so much for being with us Thank today. You. Thank we you. We appreciate so it. Thank you.